Hello, this is Math 2270 coming to you from the College of DuPage during the summer of 2020, and this is the con first continuation of the lecture entitled The Heat Equation and Before continuing with our solution of the one-dimensional heat equation boundary value problem, we need to pick up two additional tools. Uh, so we're going to uh, visit the strom louisville uh, ODE boundary value problem consideration and here we'll see that eigenvalues and eigenvectors return and we're going to be talking about a separation of variable techniques that will work for PDEs. Okay, so many applied problems demand that we solve a two-point boundary value problem involving a linear differential equation that contains a parameter lambda. And we seek values of lambda for which the boundary value problem has non-trivial, that is, non-zero solutions. So, here's the one we're going to do is y double prime plus lambda y is equal to zero. And y at zero is equal to zero, and y at l equal zero. Now notice since zero does not equal l, uh, that is a boundary value problem. We're going to talk about three cases, lambda equals zero, lambda less than zero, and lambda greater than zero. Now, for lambda equal to zero, the solution of this um, is, is going to be uh, y double prime equals zero, and that's going to be this linear equation. But when we apply the boundary conditions, y at zero equals zero and y at l equals zero, uh, we'll end up finding that uh, c2 and c1 both equal zero. So for lambda equals zero, we only get the trivial solution, y is equal to zero. For lambda less than zero, we can write lambda equal minus alpha squared, because alpha squared is always going to be positive. Um, and they say alpha denotes a positive number. Certainly alpha squared does. With this notation, uh, the roots of, uh, of this equation then are uh, alpha and minus alpha. And uh, so uh, the interval we're working on is finite, and so we can write the general solution in this way. Now you see this is d squared minus alpha squared. This is not d squared plus alpha squared which would end up with a sine and cosine, but here you get the hyperbolic cosine and the hyperbolic sine. But now when y of 0 is uh, inserted, uh, we find out that uh, we just get c1, but we know that y of 0 is equal to 0, so that means c1 is equal to 0. Thus, this is the only thing we have left. But the second condition, y at l equals 0, demands that c2 hyperbolic sine of alpha L is equal to zero and for alpha not equal to zero that says that this uh, does not equal to uh, zero and consequently we're forced to choose C2 equals zero. So again the only solution is the trivial solution Y is equal to zero. Wow. But case three for lambda greater than zero we can write lambda equal alpha squared where alpha is a positive number and because the auxiliary equation is now um, m squared plus alpha squared, that is the operator is d squared plus uh, alpha squared, we know that um, our general solution looks like y is equal to c1, now it is cosine alpha x plus c2 sine of alpha x, but as before if y of 0 is equal to 0 that means that c1 is equal to 0, so y is equal to c2 alpha x. Now but if we insist that y of l is equal to 0 and c2, uh, we don't want to um, be 0 because that would mean this is 0 yet again. So we require c2 does not equal to 0, but this is satisfied whenever alpha l is a multiple of pi, an integer multiple of pi. So alpha l is an integer multiple of pi, that means alpha is equal to this, and that means that alpha squared, and we're going to call that lambda sub n, is equal to n pi over l whole squared for n equal 1, 2, 3, and so on and so forth. So therefore, for any real non-zero C2, this is a solution for those um, uh, value for each n. And uh, so because the differential equation is homogeneous, any constant multiple is also a solution. So we can take uh, C1 to be 1, and so we see that this sequence of numbers, lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on and so forth, and the corresponding sequence of functions, this, this, and this, are all non-trivial solutions. 
of this problem, y double prime plus lambda in y uh, is equal to zero, and you have those conditions. These numbers, lambda n equal n squared pi squared over L squared, for which the boundary value uh, possess non-trivial solutions, are eigenvalues. And these functions, y sub n equals sine n pi x over L, are called the eigenfunctions. Now the graphs of these, uh, for uh, five of these uh, solutions, are shown in the next figure. Notice that they all pass through and satisfy the boundary conditions as well. So their sum would satisfy the boundary condition as well. Okay, we all need that. We'll also need this. If you want to find the product solution of this, and this almost looks like the um, heat equation that we have, except instead of saying T here, we're saying Y, uh, but you see it looks very, uh, very similar. And here is the technique that we use here. We say, well, suppose that a solution can be written that is capital X of X times capital X of Y. So we're assuming that this is true. If we plug that into the differential equation that we have up here, you see the partials become ordinary derivatives. So we'll have x double prime y is equal to 4xy prime. Well, this can be have variables separated. So you can have x double prime over 4y is equal to y prime over y. And you see this is a, a, a function of x. This is a function of y. And so they have to be a constant, and we're going to call the constant minus lambda. So we get two ordinary differential equations here then. Uh, for this one, we have y double prime over 4x is equal to minus lambda. That means we get this has to be equal to 0. And when we use this one, we have y prime over y is equal to minus lambda. We get this one. Now we have three cases. But these are three cases like we've studied before. And so what we see in case one, uh, we end up with this as a solution. In case two, uh, and again, um, this is d squared uh, minus four, minus two alpha whole squared. And so you get the hyperbolic solutions and you get this is my solution for y. So the product is going to be this. And in case three, you get this is going to be d squared plus two alpha whole squared. And so here you're going to get sines and cosines. And here you're going to get the uh, exponential uh, minus alpha squared y. So we get this as our solution. And if we were to add together some uh, finite combination of these, it also would be a solution because that is a linear differential equation. Now, we're going to assume right now that whenever we have an infinite set of solutions to this equation, we can construct it in there just by adding them all together. So now let's return to the problem that we had. And you can see we've talked about this solution, but when we start looking at this in terms of separating the variables, we will see this will happen as we separate the variables, and I will get this equation and this equation. But now look what happens here is I will realize that when I look at the boundary conditions 0t and lt, what I will find out is that this is the strom louisville equation again. And that means that the only solution is going to be the one where lambda is equal to alpha squared is greater than 0. That means that I will have the eigenvalues that we talked before and the eigenvectors that we talked before. And now we're going to look at our solution. It's a product of x, which we found to be um, this uh, uh, sign of, uh, these are the eigenfunctions. And then we're going to be multiplying that by the solution to the uh, t function, which is this for the same values. And we see that each u sub n of x is equal to f of x is equal to uh, some a sub n uh, times that. But you see, we um, cannot expect that to be satisfied for arbitrary uh, choice. So what we're going to say is that's maybe not a solution to the problem. But 
we're going to say, what if you added up an infinite number of these and plug that in, and now you have u of x0 is equal to f of x is equal to this. Now, the problem is, can we find a sub n such that this is true for f of x? And that's what we're going to continue discussing in lecture 41.2. So the question is, given y equal f of x, can we find the correct a sub n for all n? This was Fourier's challenge, and one we will begin to address in 41.2. When last we left off, uh, you were working on this problem. You were determining for what values of p does the uh, improper integral from 1 to infinity of dx over x to the p converge. Uh, and when does it converge and what is its value. I hope you had a chance to finish this, but if not, you have a chance now. You know what to do. Let's see how you did. All right, so let's take p not to be equal to uh, 1, and so it's a number, and so this um, definite integral going up to a uh, number b is going to be this. You add 1 to the exponent, and you divide by the new exponent. You evaluate it at these. We'll plug those numbers in, and we will get this, and so we'll have 1 over 1 minus p. This is 1 over b to the p minus 1 minus 1. So this um, improper integral is going to be the limit as b goes to infinity of that. You take the limit as b goes to infinity, this uh, part will go to um, 0 if, um, uh, if p is uh, greater than 1. And so that means this is minus 1 times that, and you switch the denominator around and you get that. So that is what we get if p is bigger than 1. If p is less than 1, then this is a b to a negative number, which makes it in the numerator, and it becomes infinite. Therefore, the integral converges to this value if p is greater than 1, and it diverges if p is less than 1. Now you might ask, what happens if uh, p is equal to 1? Well, we actually did this one already, and we found that it diverged. So the answer is, um, it diverges if p is less than or equal to 1, and if p is greater than 1, it converges. Here's another one for you to evaluate. This one goes from minus infinity to infinity of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. You know what to do. Let's see how you did. Now this is one of them that we need to uh, break up, and we look at the picture of it over here, and we can see that uh, this is an even function, and so that makes us realize that, gee, it would probably be sent, make sense for us to break at zero. So you see this uh, integral from minus infinity to infinity is going to be the sum of the integral from minus infinity to zero and from zero to infinity. Now we have to evaluate each of these improper integrals. Um, so let's start with this one. And uh, you might recall, and this is good review for the final exam, that this is the inverse tangent. And so that's the inverse tangent we're evaluating at uh, these points. And the inverse tangent of 0 is 0, but the inverse tangent of, um, as you go to minus infinity, is minus pi over 2. And so this answer, that's a minus minus, so that is going to be pi over 2. And when we evaluate the um, other uh, integral, and you, we could just take advantage of the fact that this area is equal to this area, but I show it here anyway, but you're going to get pi over 2 for that also. If you had pi over 2 and pi over 2, you get pi. Converges, and the answer is pi. Here is a problem called number 3. You want to determine if this integral is convergent or divergent. And if um, convergent, find its value. It's the integral from minus infinity, this time up to 0, 1 over the square root of 3 minus x dx. You know what to do. Let's see how you did. This is what the graph is, and you can't really tell from the graph what's happening. It really depends on how fast that is uh, dropping, but we have to calculate it then. And so we'll go from minus infinity up to uh, 0, 
So we will be calculating, we'll make that t, and that's the limit as t goes to infinity. So now we're going to calculate this. Now you have to change your variables here, and so you're going to let u be 3 minus x. That means du is going to be minus dx, and so you have to uh, accommodate that when you do this, and you're adding 1 to the exponent. But when you do that, you're going to get that this is minus 2, square root of 3, minus uh, x. We're evaluating it, that at 0 and at t. And so when we evaluate it at 0, of course, we'll get minus 2, the square root of 3. And then there's a minus sign. When we evaluate it at t, we put t in and we'll get this. But as t tends to minus infinity, you see this part blows up. So that is this. And so the answer is this one diverges. Uh, here's another one You're to determine if this integral is convergent or divergent. And if it is convergent, find its value. So we're going from minus infinity to infinity, x e to the minus x squared dx. You know what to do. Let's see how you did it. Uh, again, the picture gives us some incentive to look at it. We see parts of it are negative and parts of it are positive, and we're motivated to think about breaking at 0 to see what and happens. And that's where we will break it. So we have this uh, infinite integral is equal to the integral from minus infinity to 0 plus the integral from 0 to infinity, and we look at each one of these. So we look at the one going from minus infinity to 0. We can do a u substitution on this, and we get is still the limit as t tends to minus infinity of this expression. We plug in the numbers, and we get this. And what happens when t tends to minus infinity? What happens is e to the minus t squared tends to 0. And so you get minus 1 half. So this first integral is convergent. This does not mean that the second one is also convergent. We have to look at that one as well. And so we do this one. Uh, some similar things happen, except the t goes to positive infinity. And we get 1 half. So the integral is convergent. And in fact, the answer is 0. You see the positive and the negative integrals cancel out. The areas cancel. Uh, here's another one. This is to determine if the following integral is convergent or divergent. If it is convergent, find its value. You're integrating from minus 2 to infinity, sine of x dx. You know what to do. Let's see how you do it. Now, the picture, again, will give us insight as to what happened. We're going from minus 2 all the way to infinity. So we can see that this oscillates uh, in this way. Uh, gives us a little bit of insight. But now what we're going to do is calculate it. So first we change it into a limit. It's a limit as t tends to infinity of minus 2 to t sine of x dx. We do this uh, integral. Again, this is good review for the uh, final exam. This is minus cosine of x evaluated at t in minus 2. Now the cosine of 2 is just a number. That's the cosine of 2 radians. So that's just a number. And uh, you subtract this off. But as t tends to infinity, you see this never really gets close to and stays close to a number. It oscillates between 0 and 1. So this limit does not exist. So the integral is divergent. Uh, we will continue this discussion in 41.2.